You know, I got to tell you, folks, honestly, if, if during a worship service at any time you feel the movement of the Spirit, where Griffin, if you feel the movement that, that Griffin feels at times, where you just want to go, amen, you know, you, you can do that. <clears throat> I think the angels would really look down and smile, so, all right. Hey, folks, grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord, and our Savior at Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what Christ asks us today in this text. I mean, this is his, this is his request. This is his pleading. It's not a suggestion. It's just his instruction. He asks us to pursue perfection in, in love. Love is more than a feeling. It's, it's a mindset. It is a, it is a willingness to uh, engage another. It's a willingness to serve. But this is, this is a critical teaching. And it's one that we often ignore. That we put on a back burner. That we, that we let go of. Yet, it distinguishes us as Christians from every faith and every philosophy in the human family. It's the concept of agape love, of the love of God. It's a love that is vastly superior to any human love. But it's not rocket science. It's not impossible. Jesus has shown the way. He, he's lived it out for us. It's a matter of the will. It's a choice. Notice how, how Christ describes it. He tells us first to, to love our enemies. Now, now think about that. Okay, Think about that. The world... You know, uh, as in all of its wisdom, the world in all of its wisdom, uh, as well as our own sinful nature, tells us to, to love our family and, and to love our friends. They, they don't tell us to love our enemies, to engage them in constructive ways. Now, it's natural to love our family and, and our friends, is it not? It's, that's natural. Even the godfather of, of the old mafia families, folks, loved his family and, and loved his friends. Anybody can do that. Christ says, I mean, if, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than, than others? Don't even the Gentiles do that? And then he says, be perfect, be, be complete. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is, is perfect. Christ is calling us to love as God loves. So let's put it so that no one in this room can miss it. If you and I only love those who love us. Those who, who look like us. Those who speak the same language you and I speak. Those who value the same things that, that you and I value. Or who, who vote the same way that you and I vote and ignore everyone else 
or even despise everyone else. If, if that's our mindset, if that's where we're at, if that's what we say is okay, you and I, we may be nice people. We may be in some ways good people. We may be responsible people. But you and I, if that's where we're at, if, if that's what we're saying is okay, then you and I are really, really struggling with what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If we're going to follow Jesus, then you and I are going to need to be complete in our love. We're going to need to seek a love that extends to everyone in the world. Because Jesus says so. That's agape love. God's love. I mean, notice how Jesus puts it. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He says, this is how God operates. Deal with it. It's not your choice. God created everyone. In other words, God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't say, I'm going to cause tornadoes to fall on the Iranians and let the United States only have beautiful weather. God doesn't say, I'm going to cause a drought in, in Pakistan, but make certain that the United States gets plenty of rain. God doesn't bless people according to their political philosophies or even their religious persuasions. Some TV evangelists would send blights on certain cities, say Hurricane Katrina on New Orleans, that the reason that happened on, on New Orleans is because God sent it upon them. But Jesus, folks, is absolutely clear that God doesn't play that way. What you don't hear in these discussions that go on around us is Jesus being quoted. You never hear Jesus being quoted in these attacks. Do you? And for Christians, folks, that's, that's disconcerting. This 
this is to say that, that everyone we meet is to be the object of our love. That there's a spark of the divine in everyone because God's created everyone and has an investment in everyone. Does he not? I might not like in any way, shape, or form what someone is doing, what someone is about. But God created that person. And that's the reason we send missionaries around the world. And that's why we're involved in evangelism. We are the conduits through which God's Spirit is reaching out. How in the world do we draw people unto the Lord? Now let me tell you, that doesn't mean that we don't use common sense in our dealings with people. I, one of my a passage texts that I hold to is where Jesus says, be as innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. He told that to the disciples, and he tells it to us. But I'll tell you, it does mean that our basic orientation is to bring God's love to everyone we meet. Now this sounds like a radical notion, folks. In this world in which we live, this sounds like a radical notion which, which in itself should surprise us. Since it's at the heart of Jesus' teaching. There was a book that was very popular a few years ago titled The 100, A Ranking of the Most Influential Persons in History by Michael Hart. Jesus, folks, doesn't show up on that list until number three. I thought Jesus was going to be right there at the top. In my mind, he is. But not on that list. And it was very interesting as to why. Hart says that he would have had absolutely no trouble at all placing Jesus as number one. Especially because of the uniqueness of, of Jesus' teachings. A vast array of teachings. Uh, especially about this, this loving your, your enemies. But he does it. And here's why. He writes, now, now these ideas about loving your enemies, which were not part of the Judaism of Jesus' day, nor of any other religion, and they weren't. It was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what Jesus comments on in the text today, right? He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, Now these ideas about loving your enemies, which were not part of the Judaism of Jesus' day, nor of any other religion, are surely among the most remarkable and original ethical ideas ever presented. If they were widely followed, Hart says, I would have had no hesitation at all in placing Jesus first in this book. But the truth is, Hart continues, they are not widely followed. In fact, they aren't even generally accepted. Most Christians consider the injunction to, quote, love your enemy as, at most, an ideal which might be realized in some perfect world, but one which is not a re reasonable guide to, to conduct 
in the actual world we live in. We do not normally practice it, do not expect others to practice it, and do not teach our children to practice it. Jesus' most distinctive teaching, therefore, remains an intriguing but basically untried suggestion. Now, I think that's a little harsh, more than a little harsh, and I don't think it's necessarily true. Because I think there is an element, a great element of mercy and well-being played out, but there is also a divisiveness. There is a judgmental spirit that also comes across very loud. Think about that for a moment, and it's going to break your heart. This outside observer is saying to us that the primary reason that we're not turning the world upside down, why the Christian faith is losing ground, is that we have, for all practical purposes, discarded Christ's most distinctive teaching. And that we're no better than the world to whom we are seeking to witness. That they, the outside world, sees little difference in our behaviors, in our words, in our interactions, than you see in the world at large. And he says, no wonder the world is unimpressed. But I'm here to tell you today, folks, it doesn't have to be that way. And we can do better. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. And it starts here. It starts in our own hearts. It starts in our own lives. This is one of Christ's most distinctive teachings, friends. It's something for us personally to consider, seriously ponder. How can we go about showing agape love, the love of God, to the world in which we live? Beginning in our own families, in our own extended families, where is there reconciliation that needs to take place? People that need to be re-engaged. In our own churches, where passive-aggressive behavior is stopped, where we deal honestly and openly with one another. In our own communities, how about in national debate on the issues and on an international stage? Folks, what do we stand for as Christians, as followers of Christ, using Jesus' teachings? We fall back so often on the world's wisdom. What we're challenged with today is Jesus' teachings. What do we do? What do we stand for? Because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. He is my Lord. He is your Lord. We all, we've got to just grapple with these teachings. What do we do with them? Something for us all to think about this week. Amen.